you get people calling in that finally feel like they have something to say. Don't say anything all year, but when the burn, the building is burning. What about when you saw the match get lit? Why didn't you say Hey, dog. Here? I'm part of a it podcast. You know, everybody's got a podcast now, Slay. Mm. <laughs> that makes you an expert if you have a podcast now. Yeah. Welcome back into The Door Report, episode 260. On a pretty lovely Tuesday evening, February 20th, 2024, I am Will Byram. Joined as always by my pot stirring co host, Trevor Hewlin, better known in the Twitterverse as Hack Squat Jim Duggan. Dude, it's what we do, baby. We stir the pot. This ain't the old Vanderbilt. This is the new Vanderbilt, dude. You better come correct. Trevor's been on one around Nashville sports media. Some of what's happened over the last week has been unprovoked. Other sports media just attacking me over six-month-old beef. We're not even going to mention a name or discuss that at all in this episode because that's what he wants. A great value brand, Clay Travis. We don't need to mention a name. You know who I'm talking about. Very annoying. Trevor also decided to stir the pot by calling in to 104.5 The Zone with their, th- with their show, 3HL. We'll get into that on episode 260, but the door report, I forgot to mention it, is powered by 615 Collectibles. If you're into sports cards, sports memorabilia, or sports of any kind, check out 615 Collectibles on eBay. Just search 615 Collectibles on the bar. Website will be coming soon, dropping this summer. June slash July is the soft launch date. So 615collectibles.com should be up and running and ready to rock summer of this year summer of 2024 trevor we have the vandy boys opening weekend to recap you were in attendance on both saturday and sunday dude, correct? of course dude it was opening weekend you know i had to be there baby you, you were, know i had to be there you were making all the stops around nashville called into 1045 got some air time got some camera time on the SEC Network broadcast of Vanderbilt, I forgot game about two that. Yeah, FAU, Ron Slay hates that I was on the same network. As slugs, him. He hates it. Slugging some beers alongside our friend Axel. Dude, salute to Big salute. Axe. We also have to recap. Recaps maybe a strong word, but Vanderbilt basketball has played a couple games uh, since the last time we recorded. One win, one loss. A pretty miraculous win, actually, on an incredible play by Ezra Mignon. Mm-hmm. We'll touch on that very briefly. And then we'll hit on the TDR first 1045, more specifically, Hack Squad first 1045. And I like to think of it as Vandy versus 1045. It, it kind of is in a way. And that will lead us into the Jerry Stackhouse hot seat discussion, which will be all kind of intertwined with the Hack Squad verse 3HL controversy. But before we get into all that and much more, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Door Report. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. And while you're at it, give our podcast five stars and a review on iTunes. I want to reemphasize YouTube. I I think it's still catching some people by surprise. We're posting the full episodes. We're not doing clips or anything like that. We don't have time for that. If somebody wants to yes. clip stuff for us, shout out to HMD. He does it a lot. Yeah. Shout out to uh, Jerry. He does it a lot. Yeah, it's it's one of those things. I know how to do it. I just don't have the time to spend clipping down our long. Maybe I should start boring episodes. Stuff. I should start. Helping so if anybody out, out the there, if anybody out there wants to clip up the podcast, add some auto captions onto it through CapCut, send them on over. We'll post them, and we'll be forever grateful. But we're struggling to grow the YouTube channel a little bit <laughs> because we're also refu- refusing to do that. Probably the same reason we have a ton of followers on Twitter and not a ton of followers on Instagram because yeah. we, ref- we just haven't posted clips. But Trevor, that was a long rant to say. It's now time for segment one. Welcome back into episode 260 of The Door Report. To start off this locked and loaded episode 260, we have Vandy Boys Baseball to talk about. Actually have the first midweek game of the season 
going on on the TV as we're recording. Vanderbilt currently up three to one over Dayton in what is that? The bottom bot- bottom five, one out. Bottom of the fifth, one out. The Vandy boys took on FAU over the weekend, won the series, did drop the Saturday game to FAU in walk-off fashion. First walk-off of the season. Vanderbilt won game one, 12 to 11, lost on Saturday, five to four, and then dominated on Sunday, winning 11 to one. Trevor, like I mentioned in the intro, you were in attendance for games two and three. I've seen a lot of overreaction both directions yeah. from Vanderbilt fans. That's that's understandable. You see more negative overreaction early than you see positive overreaction. I think it's too early, but what did you see in the first three games? In the first three games as a whole, I was very impressed with the bats. Very impressed, especially Friday and Sunday. Super impressed with the bats. Saturday, they did lack a little bit. I will add the preface. Anybody who's played baseball... It's tough to play baseball in the cold. It, from a pitcher standpoint, the ball gets slick. It's hard to throw the ball. Uh, from a hitter's perspective, it's hard to hit. The bat stings. You just don't have a really good feel at the plate. It's really, really funky. And two, just from uh, the terms of atmosphere, if you hit a ball in the cold, it does not carry the way it does in spring or summer. That's just a scientific fact. It was, what, 38 degrees on Saturday? Dude, it was cold as hell. It was cold. You were sitting out there in left field. I know you're freezing your Dude, ass off. Well, so here's the thing. The first five innings, it was really nice because I had the sun on me. So I almost thought about ditching the vintage starter jacket. Shout out to Papa Tommy for giving that to me. Um, but, dude, sixth inning when the sun went down, my no- like my nose automatically started to run. It was, it was instantaneous. It was cold. Um, over, I'll, I'll give you one. So that was my – one positive outlook on on the weekend series is I thought the bats did really well. Uh, maybe a negative outlook is the bullpen. Ugh, the bullpen makes me a little bit nervous, which I don't think is. Sh- I'm I'm hoping that it's just because it's the first series of the year, and there's just rust. It's just part of baseball. The bullpen Friday was kind of iffy. Um, gave up a big lead. FAU came storming back. Of course, Vanderbilt wins in walk-off fashion. The bullpen made me a little bit nervous. Um, Saturday, I was a little bit nervous going in, knowing that Bryce Cunningham was going to be the starter. Um, that first inning, he had me he had me scared as hell. Gave up a hit. Um, let's but, but, let's take a step. Let's recap who the starters were. Yes, for each yes. of the games for people that didn't watch. I love talking baseball, so dude, just get me is, on tangent and I'll go, baby. This is this is Trevor's cup of tea. This, this is, is I Trevor, love baseball. This is a main reason why I think Billy initially brought you on was that your involvement of investment in baseball. I love on top Vandy of baseball. the dynamic personality I, you bring. I love course. Vandy Not boys baseball. Love college baseball. Love major league baseball, dude. I love indie baseball. <laughs> baseball, period. But game one, Grayson Carter came out as the starter, went three innings. Uh, Game two, Bryce Cunningham came out as the starter, went four innings. And then, or what did I just say, game two? Game three, Devin Futrell came out, pitched six innings. Definitely Futrell of the starters looked the best out He looked great, man. Um, Futrell obviously looked great. was throwing nothing but gas. He looked electric. Um, Going to the Friday game with um, Grayson Carter, I have very, very high expectations for Grayson Carter for the 2024 season. I think he can be a real workhorse. He's got to find the zone. Got to find the zone. I will say, though, in his defense, the way that game started, you're. I think he was like six pitches away from like the game starting. He has six warm-up pitches, and then the umpire comes out and says, hey, you're doing something. F- I'm still not entirely sure what. If anybody it knows. It was something with his throwing motion. Yeah, if like, anybody knows what was going on, there was just a delay to start the opening game. They of the did season. not like the way he was throwing. I had somebody tell me that they said that it would like equate to maybe a bulk. If somebody was on base, but there was something funky with this throwing motion. They were checking his wrist. I thought they were going to make him take off a bracelet or something. Um, that's tough to, this is how you warmed up. This is how you've prepared for this game all week long, months in advance. You're six pitches away from the start of the game. And the umpire comes to the mound and says, hey, you have to change that. That really rattles a guy. And I thought he bounced back really well. I thought, I, I agree, has to 
control it a little bit more. But I tell you what, man, that first pitch when he hit 99 and a half, he threw that and I was like, this kid's got some stuff. I'm 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 big into Grayson Carter. I think you're right. If he can control his fastball in particular and maybe develop his breaking stuff a little bit more, I think he's going to be a dynamic pitcher. Yeah, I mean, pretty much all I saw, you're the baseball expert here. I just saw he struggled to find the zone. Seven walks, unless I'm mistaken, yeah. in just three innings pitch. So Grayson Carter, he has the stuff. Can he pitch the stuff in the zone? Game two, Bryce Cunningham came out. Five strikeouts, four innings pitched. Vanderbilt's bats just weren't there. Mm, no. The only time this weekend they didn't score double digits, it's going to be up and down. Trevor, I thought you were the curse. Uh, at this, why I does thought everybody you were, think that I am a curse? This is crazy you, to me. There were people, what did I do? I almost got on board saying we got to sacrifice him. What have I done? I, I don't get it. Vanderbilt comes out game one, puts up 12 runs, wins on a walk-off. Your happy ass trots into Hawkins Field. <laughs> All of a sudden, on Saturday, game two, Vanderbilt can't hit the ball to save their life. Only puts up four runs and loses to FAU. But then you proved maybe you're not the curse. Maybe, yeah, maybe I'm not the Maybe problem, I guys. am the curse because I watched both game one and game two, which were game one they won, Yeah, but started out hot, and then it became less enjoyable, and they had to win in dramatic fashion. Game two was not fun to watch on television, <laughs> I'll tell you that. And I did not watch game three. Game three was the best performance yes. the entire weekend. So I'm back on the calls that I'm the actual problem. I don't think it's and you, And you're though. just saving me from the brunt of the criticism. I don't, I don't think it's you. Let's let's be logical here. We're, we're a school, we're, we're fans of schools that is a, a, a perennial world-class education. Let's use some logic and reason here. The game they lost was very cold. Baseball, it's hard to play in cold weather. Let's use logic and reason here and say that, hey, they didn't have their best game. There were a lot of infield errors, um, especially at third base and at short. But let's use some reason here. Maybe just say, hey, it's tough to play baseball in cold weather, and maybe FAU just got the better of us. Maybe there is no curse that you win some, you lose some. You play 50 games it, for a reason, guys. Vanderbilt baseball might not have a curse, but there's no. some curse going around Vanderbilt athletics in general the entire vibe there is some curse we have not identified there is but there I, I'm wondering if Vanderbilt is built on a Indian burial ground there's a possibility Vanderbilt was one of the tycoons of the time who knows are we atoning for sins of Cornelius Vanderbilt we might be Blake might need to chill out on those Cornelius edits <laughs> Blake Fromang on Twitter but it's angering edits. the spirits but I just also wanted to point out that FAU, all of these opening season series with out-of-conference opponents are not created equal. Mm -hmm. FAU is not a great baseball program, but they're a very good mid-major baseball yeah, program. Yeah, absolutely. God, I just wanted to read off how many times they've appeared in the NCAA tournament since 2010, so the last 13 seasons. They went to the tournament in 2010, 2013, 2015, 2016, 2018, and 2019. And the seasons that they didn't go to the tournament, 2020 through 2023, they weren't awful seasons. 2020, obviously, shortened year with COVID, 10 and mm -hmm. 6. 2021, they went 32 and 25. 2022, they went 35 and 23. And then last season, FAU went 34 and 25. Solid baseball program. John McCormick as the head coach mm -hmm. there. So it's not. All is not lost. Vanderbilt won the series against a solid program. There was some a, a quite a bit of negative reaction from fans after the loss on Saturday. Yeah. And there was also like this upset alert type vibe that was being sent out. Baseball's different. You win the series. Yeah. Base, well, the baseball's series. just different. I think it was Nash tweeted out some standards that you need to have, which is win the series and out of conference or something like that. Get a certain number of SEC wins and make the ncaa tournament as a host site absolutely that's the goal yeah. you can't really judge that after the first weekend you can't overreact positive or negative but i liked what i saw yeah that's i think it's the overall narrative I, I thought that too i thought bryce cunningham i was a little bit iffy on him started out a little bit iffy ended up having a really good game 2.25 era uh, allowed three hits one run one earned run um three base on balls five strikeouts though five strikeouts and i believe he pitched four innings so that's pretty good. I wish I had um, – I'm probably going to get the subscription to Baseball America again so I can get the advanced desk because I'd like to know what his whip was. Um, but, yeah, I thought on Saturday, I thought he had a a, a really good outing. 
Um, and then once again, the bullpen comes in and it has a little bit of a rough start. So as we mentioned, Vanderbilt right now, top of the sixth, still up three to one against Dayton. Coming up tomorrow, the Vandy boys play, are at home against Eastern Kentucky, 4.30 p.m. tomorrow, which I guess today, because this will be released tomorrow morning. And then this weekend, they have an interesting series mm -hmm. against the Zags. Gonzaga coming into town, three games this weekend, be at the Hawk and support the boys. I'll probably be there for one game. One game? One, yeah, one or two. I might. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll be there for probably a game, though. I hope. I hope. Speaking of being in attendance and watching, Vanderbilt basketball had a couple games we've got to get to. Oh, gosh. Vanderbilt actually won another SEC game. Two SEC wins on the season. The Vanderbilt Commodores and Jerry Stackhouse defeated the Texas A&M Aggies. As the balloons come as up the on the screen to celebrate. celebrate alongside us, Ezra Mignon made an incredible play at the end of the game. It was not a walk. Ball got knocked out of his hands. Yep. Hit the shot. Incredible win. Will knows ball. I like to I like to enjoy the wins regardless of what is going on, on the outside. A couple wins <laughs> is not going to make this decision change for Candace Story Lee. No. It, beating Texas A&M is not going to change anything. I do want to point out, however, I think it was like five episodes ago, mm -hmm. you were concerned Vanderbilt was going to go winless in SEC play. Oh, I was. Yeah, I and, thought it was a foregone conclusion. And do you remember what two teams I pointed out? You did. That Vanderbilt you called it. would have potential to beat, and that was Missouri and Texas A&M, even, even after Texas A&M upset Tennessee mm -hmm. on the road. So I did call that. I get a lot wrong, but when I get some right, I'm going to take my credit. Oh, dude, flaunted. Vanderbilt then decided to go on and get absolutely embarrassed, dominated, obliterated, destroyed by the Tennessee Volunteers out east. There's no other way to put it. We were kind of, like Tennessee fans were talking about not trolling Vanderbilt fans. Vanderbilt fans were like, please troll us. We know. Yeah. We know the state of this program. You're not trolling us. I think we're going to be on the same side. Yeah. We agree here, guys. Vanderbilt lost to Tennessee 88 to 53. Let me repeat that score for everyone out there 88 to 53. I watched the first, I don't know, eight minutes, and Vanderbilt was down like 30 to eight. Yeah. This was over before it started. And Jerry Stackhouse, after the game, had an oh, interesting word. Some interesting quotes. With Joey? With Joey. I don't have the quotes pulled up in front of me, but Jerry Stackhouse's quote was along the lines of Vanderbilt's not on the same level mm -hmm. as Tennessee. No. And I agree with them. Yeah, he's right. He's right. Vanderbilt's talent and Vanderbilt's team is not on the same level as Tennessee. Rick Barnes has created a much better program out east. And they're ahead of Vanderbilt by a lot. Absolutely. No Vanderbilt fan that's been paying attention or media personality that's been paying attention has any argument to the fact that Jerry Stackhouse and Rick Barnes have gone in two completely opposite directions. Mm -hmm. And you could add in Bryce Drew at the beginning of that for Jerry Stackhouse. I'm not trying to say that Bryce Drew had no contribution to this. Yeah. So that's a part that's being left out. But Vanderbilt gets dominated by Tennessee. And once again, Jerry Stackhouse is being discussed when slash if the firing of him happens. When do you think that's going to be, Trevor? I don't think that. Uh, and when I'll, I'll take this back to a couple pods ago. You were like, what What are the odds you think Stack gets fired? I said 60-40. On the things we've been hearing the past couple of days, I'm at about 100% right now. He's getting canned. I would not be shocked if he's canned before the end of the regular season, actually. I have completely changed my tune on what uh, what I am seeing, not only on the boards, but what people are telling us um, personally. I'm very, very confident he gets fired. I would not be shocked if he is fired with regular season games still left to play. When that happens, um, I don't, I don't want to jazz up Vandy fans. I, but this is, I really believe this. I think it could happen within the next week. I hope so. I I think he could be fired within the next week. I I'll say this. This is not any inside information. This is just a hunch. I think tomorrow might be Jerry's last game as a van. I think I think tonight, whenever this gets dropped, the Georgia game that is being played Wednesday night, technically tomorrow, but when you're listening tonight, I think this might be his last game as a Vanderbilt has basketball coach. I hope you're right. I've said from the beginning, I'm still very confident 
that Candace Story Lee is going to fire Jerry Stackhouse. I've said it the entire time since the Presbyterian loss. I still think it's going to be after the season, at least after the regular season. I just don't see much of a point mm-hmm. of firing in season. Yeah, there's probably if this process is going on, there's probably already been meetings about negotiating the buyout from the contract situation, which is likely the little birdies that are murmuring and talking to old Trevor over here are murmuring because of that situation. We'll see what happens with that. But Trevor, you know what? Screw it. I'll say it. And hey, before anybody comes at us with the uh, Chuck Losey, hey, don't forget we got the OC firing right before anybody else. National media, please credit TDR with that. Um, I can't confirm buyout talks have been discussed at nauseum. There have been meetings. This is the Trevor breaking. There, news right there now. have been meetings. I'm very confident in what I've been told. There have been meetings. Don't worry, guys. So to hear some more hack squat slash Trevor talk. That was not TDR. That was me. So if I'm wrong, <laughs> come at me. Do not come at TDR. I take full responsibility, but T- I believe it. When we have some more confirmation on the murmurs, maybe it will be TDR confirmed. Right now, yeah. it's hack squat confirmed. Right now, yes. Then we'll get up to the next level, which is TDR confirmed. Whenever it's TDR confirmed, know that like stuff's hitting the that, fan. That guys. means we're at like 95%. Yeah. If, if, TDR, TDR if TDR confirms it, then... We're not Robbie. We're not the end-all, be-all. No. But... We're pretty darn confident if we <laughs> tweet it from the account. <laughs> But Trevor, there was some discussion about Jerry Stackhouse on a local radio show here on a local mm. station, 104.5 The Zone. Yes, I, I, I do. That sounds familiar. The show is called 3HL, and one of the three hosts is Ron Slay. Ronald Sylvester Slay. Former Tennessee basketball star, long European slash D-League career after uh, being SEC Player of the Year in 2003. Great personality. I'm not sure how actually dial. He's an SEC network analyst. I'm not sure how truly dialed in he is to his local Vanderbilt basketball team here. I can tell you what, it ain't much. But Trevor over here to my right took some issue with one of the comments that Slay made. I think you guys were in agreement on some things. I think it got contentious because you were on hold for an hour. Uh, well, also, he straight up lied on the phone call. He did. He but he lied about what he was talking You about. were listening the whole time. And that's what made me angry. And I'm just going to send it over to you because I want it straight from the horse's mouth. Uh-huh. What did you hear on 104.5 that prompted you to not only call in, but to call in and then wait on hold for about an hour <laughs> in order to discuss what prompted you? And how did it go? Give us the whole story here, Hack Squat slash Trevor. So now that I've cooled down a little bit and you put it like that, I kind of realize how insane that, you know, you know what I mean? Like now that I've like, I really, I, he got me angry. He got me really angry. But now that I think about it, I'm like, man, there's a lot of other things I could have been doing with my time. Instead, I did this on a Monday evening. Um, so. And Will's in this group chat. So we're in a group chat. It's me, Will, um, Billy, Scott, Braden. I am driving home from the gym. For those that don't know, I'm going to only interrupt to add context. Uh, Braden McPherson, yes. a writer for TDR. Scott Derrick assists with TDR and posting on social media. Also Billy Derrick's brother. And, then, and Billy Derrick's brother, who I was getting to, founded TDR. Yes. So that's the context of the group yes. message. It is. Um, so I'm driving home and I I'll be honest. I hate listen to one Oh four five. Um, I tune in very regularly. I probably honestly listen to them for like 30, 45 minutes, maybe an hour a day. I really do. I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I hate listen. Um, and so I'm driving home from the gym and also Braden, Scott, and Billy happen to be listening at the same time as me. So we're in the group chat. We're discussing what they're saying. We're like, can you believe they're saying this? Ron Slay at about probably the four o'clock, a little bit before, probably like 345 time, is discussing Jerry Stackhouse. So Ron, Don Davenport, and Brent Doherty are discussing Jerry Stackhouse. Ron Slay, and this is what made me call. This exactly is what made me call. Ron Slay is discussing that Jerry Stackhouse needs more time to develop kids. That is what he said. That is what made me call. 
I got so upset. I'm thinking, oh my God, it is year five. How much more time do you need? So he said, Jerry Stackhouse in year five needs more time to develop. That is what got me to call. <laughs> so I called a 104.5. The first time I call, I'm ringing, I'm ringing, I'm ringing. They don't pick up my call. It just ends. I'm like, screw this. I'm like a dog just chasing an ambulance. I call again. They don't answer. I call again. I finally get through. They're like, hey, this is 104.5 The Zone. What's your name and what do you want to talk about? I go, hi, I'm Trevor from Nashville. I need to discuss Jerry Stackhouse. And I'm talking to the producer, and I'm, I start yelling at the producer. He just wants to know what I want to talk about. And I'm like yelling. I'm like, that's so insane. How does he think that? And he's like, all right, man, cool. We'll get you on. So I wait for about an hour. I wait. It's about 4 o'clock whenever they finally pick up my call. They take my call at probably about 5 o'clock. I was on hold for an hour. I know this timeline is accurate because Trevor works different hours than I do. Yeah. Trevor starts working earlier than I do. I start working at 6 a.m. I'm hybrid. I work from home four days, three or four days a week. Trevor works from home every day. Trevor works seven to three. I work nine to five. So when he started this, I had no idea what they were talking about because I was still working, still had meetings, still had annoying shareholders to maximize value for. I also was off yesterday too. And then, yeah, also I forgot that for a lot of people, it was a holiday. <laughs> Not for me. I got to maximize shareholder value. Um, but I didn't start listening until about 4.50 or so when I turned on the radio and you were still on hold. I was still at on that hold. point. I was and tweeting out my like you had remember you had not gotten on the call because I got off work at five, took pre workout, went to the YMCA down the road, oh, and yeah. it was closed, came back, you still had not actually discussed on one oh four five yeah. what was going on. So it so it had been a very long time. They finally take my call. And I was telling Will this. We were rehashing some of the things I should have said, some of the things I shouldn't have said. I told Will this. For the hour, I didn't know I'd be on hold for an hour. I thought it would be like pretty. I haven't called into a radio show in a long time. Um, but I was, I didn't think of what I was going to say. I was just so raging mad at what I heard that for the hour and change I sat on hold, I just kept thinking about, I cannot believe he said that. I cannot believe. So I didn't game plan at all. I was just blinders on. I'm like, take my call. They took Larissa before me. I'm like, how dare they take this woman before me? I need to discuss this. Uh, so they finally get a hold of me. They're like, hey, what do you want to talk about? And I just immediately go in uh, and my voice just gets louder and louder until Ron Slay is talking to me in a very normal tone. And I'm like borderline shouting at him because <laughs> I'm so angry about uh, about what I heard. And he goes, no, I didn't say that. And I go, that's why I called. I wanted to be like, I have a group chat full of guys. We all heard that. And that is what prompted my call. Don't lie to me. And then Don Davenport like, that's not what he said. And I'm like, I listened to the whole segment. That is why I am calling. I didn't, don't, don't gaslight me. I heard what I heard. So correct me where I'm wrong on this. You called in, said that Ron Slay had made the comment that Jerry Sackhouse still needed time to develop players. Yes. And you made the comment, it's year five. He's not been able to develop talent thus far, and he still has not been able to develop talent. Then it went into the conversation about the negativity, da-da-da, whatever, and at some point it shifted to talking about the players and it not being on the coach. Yeah. And at some point the players just got to sit back, and he said something like, I didn't really develop my game in college at all. He lost me. I'm not going to lie. This he is, lost me. This on is that. where I got confused with the point he was making. Because I, we were sitting across the hall and he said that. And I look over at Will and I go, and I like I, mouth. I go, what? I had to turn off my radio so I didn't interfere with the delay. So he I was trying me. to I was listen. Like, what is he talking and about? And I was thinking in my head, and this is the only criticism I had of your portion of the commentary back and forth. He was saying, who do they have right now on the roster? And you were saying, Tyron Lawrence, Ezra Mignon, yeah. Ben Allen Lubin. And he was saying, yeah, but outside of Ezra and Tyron, you're like, Jason Rivera Torres. And then he was saying, nobody wants Jason Rivera Torres. And you got caught up in being that like. That made me mad. But, I, I but, was trying to defend my but dog. But you got caught up in defending Jason Rivera Torres. Instead then, of blaming Instead Zach. of you should have just been saying the lack of talent and guys with the dog mentality on the roster in year five is, is Jerry Stackhouse's fault. Yes. You're proving my point. I'm arguing that Jerry Stackhouse is not fit to be a coach and doesn't in college and does not have the capability to both recruit players and develop them 
and retain them. Yes. That's the whole argument. Yes. I, I don't even, like, I get caught up sometimes in the X's and O's argument that people say he's an incredible X's and O's head coach. Yeah. But I haven't really seen it. I like some of his sets. I like some of his out-of-bounds plays. But his base offense is just an Iverson cut with an on-ball screen yep. and a roll and off-ball screen action. Is that Scotty Pippen ISO AAU Yeah, under 18 ball. seconds. Yeah. It, I don't love his X's and O's, but let's not even get caught up in that. Yeah. Where are you defending Jerry Stackhouse from? Yeah. Because at first it was saying he needs more time to develop players. Then we gave you an example that he didn't develop players. Then you're saying he needs to recruit guys that have a better mentality. And we're saying it's year five. When is that going to start happening? Then he transitioned it saying, well, who's going to want this job or replace? And you gave a list of guys. And he said, we can go down a list. I'm like, I'm like you literally just asked me, dog. And I'm giving you my yeah. list. And also, too, before that, he was like, it, it, and I started, I was like, I was like, first off, how I started the call, once I got my monologue over, I was like, time to develop, guys. I was like, I'd go, Ron, that's not how college basketball works anymore. You don't develop talent. You hit the portal. I go, he knows, he knew what he needed to get in the portal, and he didn't get it. He knew he needed shooters. He knew he needed bigs. He did not get that. And then he goes, he goes on this tangent. He's like, well, well. How, how is Vanderbilt going to get guys in the transfer portal with NIL? And I go, Ron, they just did it with Tyron Lawrence. What do you, they literally just did it. They paid this guy half a mil. What are you talking about? And he goes, yeah, they did that. And then I go on this tangent. I'm like, you're confusing Vanderbilt football with basketball. And we should not do that. I'm like, that's what you're doing. And then there was, I'm, I'm losing track in this because I wasn't part of the call. So you might have to help me out here. Mm -hmm. There was also the comment kind of made like Vander you said something like Vanderbilt brought back Tyron Lawrence and he said would you say that Tyron Lawrence has produced how you oh, yeah. and you said I was like no no I, I don't think he's lived up to the NIL money that he has received mm -mm. and then he made some comment related to that about Vanderbilt you were naming he was naming off things like well they're going to struggle with this and you're like Vanderbilt basketball has had success yeah and you're like they're a perennial tournament team and you started naming off pros that they had recruited in you started talking about Bryce Drew recruiting in Darius Garland who had an injury yeah and McDonald's all Americans and then you started talking about going to the tournament consistently 2008 2010 2011 2012 2016 2017 and his comment was yeah but none of that is after success after the NIL and you hit on this really well and I wanted to yell and you say, hopped on the call. And say, Slay, I, I kind of see what you're saying. I know Vanderbilt has disadvantages. I'm not arguing with that. No one outside of like two programs in the whole country has proven success after NIL was implemented. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what success in the NIL era means. We are still learning. That was two years ago. Yeah. That was two and a half years ago. I believe, unless I'm wrong, the first portions of NIL were implemented in mid to late 2021. Yeah. No one has sustained success post NIL era of the NCAA. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is what we've seen for Jerry Stackhouse is he's certainly not the guy to bring NIL success Absolutely. in this era because he's alienated the prime donors, calling them 5.8 percenters. Yep. The most passionate portions of the fan base. So DMing fans, calling them stupid. Yeah. Call, the, these, yeah. It, you can't simultaneously use that as an excuse and saying, but Vanderbilt hasn't proven they can be successful in the NIL era. Yeah. Almost no teams have proven they can be successful small in the NIL era. We don't era. have any sample yeah, we size. Don't, maybe that's true, but yeah. we don't know that. Yet. Exactly. And you, you have to try. Yeah. What do you expect Vanderbilt fans to do? Just not try? Just be like, ah, now with NIL. Yep. Ah, yeah, who cares? Just throw it up in the yeah. air. What are, And and keep going on this call if you'd like to, but another related point is a lot of this is hitting on like the criticism from Vanderbilt fans being too much. Yes. And, and coaches being deterred from taking this job in the, that's exactly how he started it because yeah. of the criticism. And to that, that's just one of the dumbest ways to think about it's this bullshit possible. Yeah. There's no way that negative, because then on the other side, you'll talk about nobody's going to games. And yeah. so do you want passion? Or because there's you can't have just one side of the coin. No, if you have a passionate fan base, they're going to be hypercritical. Yes, Tennessee volunteers. The Tennessee fan base is a great example of that. Yep, they are they get stupidly, insanely outraged mm -hmm. and do things that are out of this world. Mm -hmm. Nobody says that 
team that coaches are going to be deterred from taking that job. No, they call them a the, proud fan base. Yeah, they're a proud fan base. Yeah. Van, this is where it gets misconstrued with Vanderbilt football and basketball. Mm-hmm. Vanderbilt football does not have a proud history and a proud fan base. No. They have fans, mm-hmm. but Vanderbilt fans are very aware of what the football program exactly. is. Exactly. Vanderbilt basketball has slash had a proud fan base. Yep. And so you have to keep that in mind that it's not this overly hypercritical Vanderbilt fans just expect one thing Mm -hmm. to make the NCAA tournament relatively consistently. Yep. Ever it's Shane Foster, Ron Slay. I think it was Ron Slay asked Shane Foster in a separate portion uh, and read off Shane's response as to I'm just confused what the expectation of this fan base is. Shane, we want to win. No, but it, but that's what Shane said, but it's simpler than that. It's even simpler. I can put it in a tangible goal. Yeah. Make the NCAA tournament every two years or at least be in the conversation as an NCAA tournament at large birth every two years. Absolutely. That's it. That's not that unreasonable. Being seven and 18 and 13th in the SEC out of 14 teams Mm -hmm. and not being okay with that with a coach in year five that's not being overly critical or negative. No, it's being real. Yeah. And for some reason, Vanderbilt fans in the minds of local Nashville media are not allowed to be critical in the same way that all other 13 SEC fan bases are. The football program is not the basketball program. No, they're different things. Yeah. And they get related too much. You are allowed to be critical yeah. of the program you are a fan of. It's not saying you're not a fan. But if you're passionate, you're going to have criticisms you want to let, lay out there. Yeah, exactly. And in this radio show, 3HL regularly references Shiano Sunday. They talk about what Tennessee fans did to Greg Shiano as something funny. And they're like, wow, what a proud fan base. Look at what they did. They tarnished this poor man. They They brought his stuff out into the business. They made lies about him. And they're like, that's a proud program. I want to raise my hand and say I hate Tennessee and the rivalry way, okay? 100%. I hate Orange. Mm -hmm. I hate Vol fans, whatever. Grew up with them my whole life, okay? That's what I'm hitting at is at my core, I like that. Yeah. I like that passion. That's what the Vanderbilt fan base needs more of. That's why we started TDR. Yes. That's why we keep doing TDR is in order to fix the lackadaisical attitude that has been so prevalent throughout Vanderbilt athletics over the last 60 years, Mm -hmm. 70 years, you have to have people on the outside giving harsh criticisms. You got to have the crazies. That's what Vanderbilt has been missing because they've been a private academic institution Mm -hmm. is they have not had the criticality they've needed Mm -hmm. and have just coasted by and collected sec checks. Yep. They're receiving the same sec revenue distribution as all other 13 schools. Yep. And they have misallocated it to university funds. Science building. Which is fine if you want to do that, but you better commit to athletics. That's all we're calling for. There's no other major program that would be okay with the state of Vanderbilt basketball right now. And also he made a comment that Missouri is still packing out their stadium. They're not. No. I watch SEC basketball. That stadium is 60% empty for every single weeknight game. I I haven't watched as much on weekends, to be honest, but every time I flip on Missouri, that gym is empty. Yep. Same with Arkansas. Yeah. If you win, butts will be in the seats. Is that So this is the other part. I know that you brought up Jerry Stackhouse sliding in to DMs and alienating fan bases by blocking season ticket holders and things. Yeah, and just shitting on fans, like, personally. He's like, you suck. And I think that's one, this is where I don't want to talk too much, because it is your controversy that you were in, oh. so I don't want to overshadow you. What where was I hitting? Him sliding into fans' DMs. I, I know where yeah. you're going with this. That's one thing. And we discuss that as if, like, everybody talks about that, that I'm trying to put this in a nice way. That that's the main factor. Yeah. That if he would have just behaved better in press conferences, didn't like playing golf on the road, didn't interact with fans in a negative way, that right now we wouldn't be calling for his job. Yep. This is completely separated from that. Mm-hmm. All of the antics in Jerry Stackhouse's past are issues with his in-game management, my issues with his base offensive system. 
if right now this Vanderbilt team was sitting at 18 and seven instead of seven and 18, we would not be calling for his job. If he was oh, you eight, said 18 and seven, was Sorry, 18 yes, and I agree. seven, I agree. instead of seven and 18, yeah. we would be talking about what an incredible job Jerry Stackhouse has done when we didn't know which direction this program was going to go. He has finally brought them back to the place they need to be. That gym would be packed tomorrow. Night. Exactly. But he hasn't done that. Mm -hmm. And Vanderbilt is seven and 18, two and 10 in the SEC, only above Missouri. Yep. 13th out of 14. It's all very simple. Fans want Jerry Stackhouse gone. And I tweeted this out, quote, tweeting Shane Foster. So I'll just read directly from the calculations I made. Never meet your heroes, kids. But the it's very simple. Vanderbilt, and I'm going to read Shane Foster's tweet I quoted with this. So Shane Foster, I'm going off on a long rant here. No, this might it. not make any sense when I go back and listen to it. But Shane Foster went on a tweeting rampage today, and one of the tweets was, in quote, from Shane Foster, follow him on Twitter, Vanderbilt Great, at Shane Foster underscore 32, not trying to hate on him. Shane Foster said, as for the fan negativity, I've had coaches reach out to me personally and ask why fans are treating Jerry Stackhouse this way publicly. Regardless of the validity, it hurts the attractiveness of the program to potential new hires and recruits. And then he went on to say in this thread, it makes the job harder and lessens the home court advantage. Opponents during games making comments like your own fans don't like y'all during free throws. Psychologically, it wears on you. I won't go too much in that, but I just quoted and said, Shane, I love you, but the answer is simple. Fans are negative because Jerry Stackhouse hasn't made an NCAA tournament in five seasons. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to tweet just separately, Jerry Stackhouse's current record where it sits right now today, February 20th, 2024, through his coaching tenure at Vanderbilt. In year five, Jerry Stackhouse is 68 and 86 overall, 26 and 56 in the SEC with zero NCAA tournament appearances and a co-coach of the year award. Yep. That's his resume. Mm -hmm. Objectively not mentioning mentioning a name. That is a fireable resume. Absolutely. That's the issue. All of the other stuff, all of the maybe, you just need to let a coach build. J Jerry Stackhouse has had time to prove he's not that guy. Mm -hmm. And this year is the perfect example. Next season, Ezra Mignon is gone. Yep. Next season, Tyron Lawrence is gone. Mm -hmm. Next season, Colin Smith is going to be coming off an Achilles injury. He might be gone too. Lee Dort is gone permanently. Mm -hmm. There is no talent to build on and develop. And Jerry Lawless put out a tweet as well that I sent to you about the Jerry Stackhouse classes. Yes. And how many of them and these guys have just been busts slash transferred out. I don't know if I need to go through amount. all of this. No, go but through them. 2019. Vanderbilt ranked 52nd in the country in recruiting. He brought in Jordan Wright, Scottie Pippen Jr., Dylan DeSue, and Oton Jankovic. Jordan Wright transferred to LSU. He developed the talent. The talent transferred out. Scottie Pippen Jr. went to the NBA. Dylan DeSue, 2021, transferred to Texas. Jankovic, bust, transferred to Tulane. Jerry Stackhouse also brought in Quentin Melora Brown and DJ Harvey in the transfer portal. Quint Melora Brown, after last season, transferred to the Citadel. DJ Harvey transferred from Notre Dame and then transferred to Detroit. Going to 2020, Vanderbilt ranked 57th in the country in recruiting. Akeem Odesipe transferred to Kent State immediately after in 2021. Miles Studi in 2023 transferred to South Carolina. Trey Thomas in 2023 transferred to Bowling Green. Isaac McBride transferred in from Kansas. He left in 2021 to Oral Roberts. Then you go to 2021 for Jerry Stackhouse's recruiting class, 30th in the country. Pretty solid, mm -hmm. actually, in the rank ranking wise. He brought in Shane Dizoni, a four star in 2022, transferred to Temple. Gabe Dorsey brought in a three star there. In 2022, he transferred to William and Mary. Peyton Daniels in 2021 transferred to Stephen F. Austin. He brought in, in the transfer portal in that same class of 2021, Jermaine Mann who transferred to Gardner-Webb. Then he also brought in Taryn Frank, transferred to TCU. He also brought in Liam Robbins, who transferred in from Minnesota, and Rodney Chapman, two very key contributors that ended up graduating from Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. So two guys really solid right there. In 2022, 
Vanderbilt. I don't know where they ranked. I think it was ninth, actually, in the country. Because this was the Lee Dort, Colin Smith, Noah Shelby class. They were pretty high. So ninth in the country. Paul Lewis, three-star, still in the roster, underperforming. Mm -hmm. Colin Smith, four-star, underperformed, and then an injury. That's this. I love Colin Smith. Yeah. I've been a big Colin Smith proponent, but that's a good summary thus yep. far. Malik Dia, a three star, the following year transferred to Belmont. Lee Dort, a four star, got arrested slash charged. Don't know what the current state is, but he's kicked off the team. Noah Shelby, four star, transferred to Rice. Adrian Samuels transferred to American and transferred in Emmanuel Ansong, a transfer from Green Bay and Ezra Mignon. And Ezra Mignon was a great transfer yes. from UC Davis. And then last season, the class ranked 26th in the country. Malik Presley, Jason Rivera Torres, who Slay immediately mentioned nobody wants. And then mispronounced his name. He didn't know who he was. He had no idea. He's, he's like, he's like, stop there. And I'm, okay. Well, guy, then if he he's not so good bad. enough and nobody would want him, then it just proves what we're saying, that Jerry Stackhouse is incapable of being a college head coach mm-hmm. and can't recruit in quality guys. Carter Lang, J.Q. Roberts, Isaiah West. I think these guys can contribute eventually. So I'm not wanting to shit on them immediately, but these are not guys to immediately come in and make an impact. No. And then in the transfer portal last year, we all remember brought in Jordan Williams, brought in Tassos Comateros, brought in Vin Allen Lubin, brought in Evan Taylor. The only guy making real, immediate, tangible, felt SEC impacts Vin Allen Lubin. Agreed. So you go through those classes and you say, what are we looking forward to? Why are we giving Jerry Stackhouse more time? He's proven he cannot evaluate and bring in talent that helps the program. And his current class in 2024 currently ranks 54th in the country. I'm not saying there's no talent in the class, but that's what people want to retain him for the 54th ranked recruiting class. That's not going to be an immediate impact. So he's got to hit the portal. But according to Ron Slay, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. So he needs to develop 54th in the country talent, I guess. Yeah. I just don't even understand how there are people on the side defending Jerry Stackhouse at this point. Are they just trying to steel man the argument? What's going on? I mean, I think I think it's truly in the here we go with my uh, with with my tinfoil hat on. And, and you brought this up. Tennessee fan wants to see Vanderbilt bad. He, he he goes on the radio show sometimes. He's like, oh, no, I'm Nashville native. I, I want to see a local team do good. No, he doesn't. He constantly dogs on Vanderbilt. So does Brent Doherty. So does everybody out there. These guys don't care about Vanderbilt. Ron Slay doesn't want to see. Well, they them do view good. themselves as like looking as if they're trying to help. The, yes, but they're not. They're talking in a condescending way and talking down to fans who have watched every second of every game and been yep reading headlines and message board posts and even with us have talked to people within the program. Yeah, and then the audacity to speak down to those people Mm -hmm. as a guy that can't even pronounce and doesn't know who Jason Rivera Torres after the call, he goes Jason Riviera Torres. And I was like, Oh my God. And the only he's employed by the sec network specifically for basketball. And the only flex is always, he breaks down games every night on sec network. And I haven't heard of Jason Rivera Torres. And it's like, okay, then you're shitty at your job. I'm, I'm granting Ron slay this. He probably has, better basketball knowledge across the sec oh yeah than i do and i'm granting him that as far as sec basketball goes overall all 14 teams ron slay you got me you got me and trevor b yeah when it comes to vanderbilt basketball you could yeah you can't hold a candle to our knowledge no will bowling you cannot hold a candle to our knowledge. Oh, we got to get into know that bozo. We know immensely more than you do yeah. about Vanderbilt athletics, about Vanderbilt basketball, about Vanderbilt football, about Vanderbilt baseball. You can prep for the next month and sit me down in a room and I will eviscerate you. With no prep. With no Coming prep. Coming straight raw. So I'm not. we're not claiming that we're experts on all sports. No. We are claiming as fans... We are experts on Vanderbilt. And yes. right now, the state of Vanderbilt basketball is reaching a breaking point that the complete lack of care from fans can only be fixed through fresh blood. Exactly. There needs to be a change at the top, even if the next guy comes in and fails. And all of these things turn out to be true that Vanderbilt just can't compete mm-hmm. in modern athletics, which I don't think is true. No. I think basketball is its own 
realm. I think Vanderbilt will struggle in football perpetually. But I think basketball, it only takes two, three, four guys. And all of a sudden, you're competing at the top of the SEC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there needs to be fresh blood, and it's time for staff. It's time. And there's levels to this in regards to the whole slay. And we haven't even gotten into Will Bowling's brief little comment. There's levels to this. Yes, you guys, not. I'm not going to even include Will Bowling. Ron Slade does know more basketball knowledge across the SEC than us. When it comes to Vanderbilt, in regards to the, everybody's got a podcast, we don't collect a check like you do to talk about sports. You collect a check to talk about sports. Also, we don't. We do this for Vanderbilt, the smallest and the historically the worst SEC program, we do this because we love this. We do this because we live, breathe, and eat this. There's levels to this. You do it for monetary gain. We do it just because we love the game. Well, it's also just the comment of everybody's got a podcast. Is like this has been Will, this has been going on. Will Byram has been doing this longer than you have been on the radio, which is fine. You got a degree in it. I work my day as a senior financial analyst for a Stevedore and Company. We just have different routes of our professional career. Yeah. But don't talk down as if you're on some pedestal that knows more or has consumed more college sports, specifically within Vanderbilt, mm-hmm. than me. You haven't. No. You have not. I guarantee put me on a polygraph lie detector. I have watched more hours of college athletics than you. Yep. And I know... I have watched a hundred times the hours of Vanderbilt sports Mm -hmm. that you have. Yeah. So just because you have a job as a local radio show host as part of a trio on 104.5 The Zone in the Nashville market doesn't mean that you automatically have an aura about you that what you speak is true. Yeah, and that you're better than, oh, everybody's got a podcast. Everybody's got a podcast. this, This guy thinks he's better than us. Because he was gifted a radio this, show. This everybody's got a podcast. Well, turns out that everybody's got a podcast you're shitting on is three thousand more followers than you on Twitter. Yeah, and I'm not tr- like I don't like to play the flexing game because, like we say, we just do this. Yes, as a fun kind as of blow off. Yeah, project. as a blow off steam thing after work. Yes, and so, but it's also like, dude, we're not coming at you saying. You are a complete idiot. No. Or you have no justification to ever speak about sports. Yeah. Like, how dare you, you lowly podcast? Yeah, you speak lowly. To me. I'm like, dude, a radio show is just an old school podcast. At yes. least we don't have 50% of our airtime spent on ad breaks about erectile dysfunction pills and you know and what? hair transplants. And you know what? Nobody asks what happened to our previous, and we love Billy. Nobody's asking whatever happened to Jason Martin a year and a half after. It is to you. We see the tweets. You took over in August. Everybody still asks, what happened to Jason Martin? The only reason I listened. Once they got rid of Jason Martin, I was done. I like Jason Martin. It's yes, also, he was good. It's also the the unnamed guy. He Jason Martin was originally Clay Travis's producer. Yeah. And I was a big fan of Clay Travis and a big fan of Jason Martin. Jason Martin's the GOAT, dude. Jason Martin, R.I.P. Wish he was still here. Yeah. So well, not R.I.P. really. He's, he's not no, actually he's, he's not alive. actually dead. He just, I didn't like he just how had I phrased, a kid, I believe. I didn't like how I phrased that. That was, all, five, that was five. That was also like sort of what I was like, oh, the late great Jonathan Krause. Yeah. And you're like, wait, That's, what? And I'm like, he's still alive. Yeah. I, I knew he was alive. I just forgot that that was a term and that you use for someone who has passed. Um, but yeah, do what a condescending, just gatekeeping the sports. Dude, this is even sports broadcasting. What we're, we're also doing, but. like the way this is what bothers me as well, because we got to go off on a tangent and then we'll end up wrapping this one up. How, what are we at on time? Almost an hour. Yeah, we're at almost an hour, brother. You said this would be a short <laughs> yeah, one. I thought dude. it would be a short one. I knew one. it wouldn't be. But it bothers me in a different way when it's sports mm-hmm. we are talking about. And you're talking about this as if it's political science, as if it's geopolitical conflict. And as we're, if we're trying to solve Palestine. Yeah, and, and if we're discussing the Gaza Strip and we're discussing the Russia-Ukraine conflict yeah. and military funding bills that mm-hmm. are tied to different things, that's not what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. We're discussing college sports. Mm-hmm. There's no reason everybody shouldn't be able to have a voice about sports. Yeah. 
Are there people that will gain audiences because they have good takes and people that won't because they don't know what they're talking about? Absolutely. Yeah. But the only thing I'm confident about in this whole world is I know what the fuck I'm talking about when it comes to sports. Yep. Probably to a fault. Yeah. To a stupid fault that I sit in I'm my room. I'm embarrassed about it sometimes. At, yeah. At midnight. And I'm like, what are you doing with your life? Why are you spending yeah. so much time invested in sports? Yeah. It's dumb. I literally, after the call yesterday, there was part of me that was like, that really thought, I know I sent the tweet as a joke, but I was like, does my dad sometimes think he raised a monster? Like I was real, I was sitting there and I was like, what are you doing, dude? Like, why did you do that? And then I just think about it. I'm like, I just, I, I would die for it's Vanderbilt athletics. Dude, this is the part that you're, you're still more emboldened on it, but I'm like, dude, the community we have been able to create with TDR that was non-existent. It's amazing. Before is awesome. That's why we have a podcast. We're not. That's some, why we keep doing it's it. It's also why it's interesting when people keep coming at us and we're like, we're not trying to flex and say we're stars bigger than you or better than you or smarter than you no. or no more. We're just enjoying this and have built an organic community within TDR. Thanks to and, the thanks to the listeners and, and the people, supporters. And people are getting bodied yeah. on Twitter. They're coming at us like they're going to do the body and keep the replies coming, guys. Yes. On Twitter, if you see people attacking Vanderbilt or attacking TDR or specifically Trevor, Hack Squat, Jim Duggan, <laughs> he's the one doing the attacking. I love, I'm attack. a little piggy, dude. I'm a big hog off the <laughs> leash. Give me in the mud, baby. <laughs> <laughs> squirming around in the mud i'm a big dude hawk. There, we see the replies and they're hilarious yes we he yes guys dude. we see everything they're you awesome tweet. Dude. even if we don't follow you we see we see what you guys are tweeting and we absolutely love it this isn't your grandpa's vanderbilt no more we're young we're in our 20s we're a little reckless it's twitter let's have fun getting into our mid to late slash real late 20s here so yeah. we're still the new generation <laughs> We're still, we'll be 40, be like, we're the young hip generation, <laughs> baby. Be 52 doing TDR on episode 3000 and be like, we're the revolution <laughs> and it's going to be televised. I'm just walking around with my so cane. I'm like, at 52? Oh, yeah. yeah. You're walk oh, you did. I blow out my back with deadlifts. Oh, yeah. We did this. Yes. That and my knees are I'm just walking around with the cane. I'm like, oh, my God, it's, it's still coming. Revolution. I'm just, I'm just murmuring to hopefully I have a wife by then. She's just like trying to read a book and I've got like coffee breath. I'm like, I told these kids to be kings. We, I told these kids to turn on the television. The revolution's coming, baby. She's like, Trevor, shut up and just go, go to bed. And I'm like, oh, you're really describing bed. 52 as like 78 as <laughs> well. Yeah. Why does your wife talk like that? <laughs> In your in your future fantasy, why is your wife talking to you, Trevor? <laughs> Sounds like she's been smoking Dude. camels. Yeah, when did you pick up smoking Marlboro Reds for two packs? Not a even day camels, have... just straight cowboy. You're killers. walking with a cane and smoking cigs at fifty two. It's been a tough last twenty five years. I'm not even sixty five yet. I'm already on supplemental security income. <laughs> <laughs> I think this might be a good way to end episode 260. You have anything else you want to add here since you've been creating controversy all over uh, Nashville? Hey, boys, keep it coming. They want to hate. We'll give them something to hate. <laughs> the vibes continue to deteriorate, <laughs> but we're still vibing, dude. TDR is still vibing. Thank you all for listening. For myself, Will Byram, and my co-host, Trevor Hewlin, this has been episode 260 of The Door Report, powered by 615 Collectibles.